So good morning, my name is Lorraine Cullen. I'm the Director of Respiratory and Radiology Services here at Gaylord Hospital. I'm a respiratory therapist by practice. I've been in the field about 25 years. And this morning, I'm going to be giving a presentation on maintaining lung health during the COVID-19 pandemic and living with chronic pulmonary disease. Uh, some of the conditions we're going to talk about this morning, COPD, including emphysema, bronchitis, asthma, cystic fibrosis, bronchiectasis, interstitial lung disease, including pulmonary fibrosis, sarcoidosis, and pulmonary hypertension. We're going to start the talk with a discussion about maintaining your lung health during the current pandemic. So it's important to recognize that you're considered to be at higher risk of severe illness from COVID-19 if you have underlying lung disease. Therefore, you should stay home as much as possible and avoid interactions with those at risk for exposure. Um, you should also wear a facial covering or mask and social distance when out in public. Um, and you should also ask those in your immediate household to follow the same rules in terms of staying home, limiting interactions, and wearing masks and social distancing in public and you should monitor yourself for any change in symptoms. If you have a slight change, a cough, a slight fever, it's best to stay home and watch that and make sure it doesn't turn into anything further before exposing others out in public. And this advice also applies to anyone who doesn't have underlying lung disease if you're trying to avoid putting yourself at risk for catching COVID. More inf information on maintaining lung health. So you wanna make sure that you follow your medication regimen from your physician. Most pharmacies are offering drive-through or delivery services when you need a prescription refill so you can limit going into um, stores and pharmacies. If you're experiencing an exacerbation of your lung disease, you want to call your doctor. Don't avoid trips to the hospital if you're having severe symptoms. With any severe condition, don't try to write it out at home. Um, throughout the pandemic, we've seen a decrease of people coming into the acute care hospitals because they're afraid of the amount of patients in there with COVID. The hospitals have done a great job of isolating. So they have COVID and non-COVID areas. They're screening patients prior to entrance to the hospital. So they've done a great job of setting it up. So if you're coming in for a different reason, that you will not be exposed. Um, and if you're nervous about a visit to your doctor's office, you can call your doctor and ask if you can do a telehealth, a phone, or an online appointment. And continue to follow your asthma action plan or COPD action plan if you have one. If you use a nebulizer at home to take your inhaled medications and you feel like you may have or have been diagnosed with COVID, you want to speak with your healthcare provider for additional precautions to take with you when using your nebulizer. That's because using a nebulizer kind of makes those particles more airborne, which could put other people at risk. So your healthcare provider could give you advice about how to limit that while using your nebulizer. You want to stay up to date on your vaccinations. Vaccines strengthen immune systems and help keep those around you healthy, especially as we get to the fall and if COVID is still present and we enter flu season. And you want to wash and sanitize your hands frequently, especially if you're going out in public. Um, make sure that you're cleaning your hands frequently. And again, I know they've said it a thousand times, but avoid touching your mouth or your face. We're going to start with COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. Um, this is a term used to describe several progressive lung diseases, which includes emphysema, chronic bronchitis, asthma, and some forms of bronchiectasis. In 2018, it was estimated that 16 million adults in the United States had COPD, and millions of others go undiagnosed. This led to the NIH National Institute of Health to develop the National Action Plan for COPD. The Action Plan, it's designed to empower people with COPD to recognize and reduce the burden of COPD, to improve the prevention, diagnosis, treatment, and management of COPD, to collect, analyze, report, and disseminate COPD-related public health data, to increase and sustain research to better understand the prevention, pathogenesis, diagnosis, treatment, and management of COPD, and to translate national policy educational program recommendations into research and public health care action. So basically developing this national action plan led to several statewide and citywide programs um, throughout communities to raise COPD awareness, leading to more diagnosis and better treatment. 
Wallingford had a collaborative work group called Healthy Wallingford 2020, um, and this initiative was focused on COPD awareness. It was um, representatives from Gaylord, Masonic Care, and the local health departments that all worked together, and some of the things we did was sponsor informational sessions about COPD in the surrounding communities. COPD is primarily recognized by increased breathlessness, um, feeling of shortness of breath, and coughing, and most people mistake this for a normal part of aging, um, which contributes to the high population of undiagnosed COPD. COPD is classified in grades or stages of one through four, with four being the most sym symptomatic or affected, and often people aren't diagnosed until they're in stage three or four because the early symptoms um, were seen as a normal sign of aging and not addressed. In the early stages of COPD, your symptoms may be mild. Um, that's why it's important to discuss this with your healthcare provider, and they will most likely order a spirometry test, um, which measures your force of breathing and volumes, which help your physician determine if you're in a normal range for your age, weight, height, and gender. And changes in spirometry allow your physician to determine if your breathing is affected and monitor the progress of your COPD over time. And again, spirometry with your physician is the best way to diagnose COPD. And I'm just going to briefly go over what spirometry is. Um, so it can be done in a physician's office with something as simple as a handheld machine that looks similar to this. Your physician will most likely put a nose clip on you, which is the worst part um, because it's very uncomfortable. So a nose clip so that your breathing is just primarily through your mouth and you're not breathing in and out through your nose. And then they'll have you do some tests which require you to take big deep breaths in and blow them out fast and hard through the mouthpiece into the machine which is measuring your force and your volume of breathing. Um, and if you've ever had one done before, it's the test where the person on the other end often us, the respiratory therapist is saying, keep breathing, keep breathing, keep breathing, blow it out, blow it out, blow it out. Um, that's because we want to make sure we get your maximum effort so when we're using this machine we can get a good picture of what's going on with your lung health. Then your signs and symptoms of COPD, increased breath increased breathlessness, frequent coughing with or without sputum production, wheezing, that feeling of tightness in the chest. Um, sometimes the wheezing can be so pronounced that you can hear it out loud when you normally breathe, um, and sometimes it's more subtle where those of us who assess you in the office hear it when we listen with a stethoscope. Risk factors and common causes for COPD, most are caused by inhaling pollutants, this includes smoking, cigarette smoking, pipes and cigars, and most recently vaping. Um, it'll be decades till we know the full effect of vaping and COPD development, but a good deal of research has focused on this in the past several years, and we've already started to see the negative effects on lung function and young, otherwise healthy individuals. Um, other risk factors include secondhand smoke, fumes, chemicals, and dust found in many workplaces. All of these contribute to individuals who develop COPD, and genetics can also play a role in COPD. There's also uh, alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, and the symptoms are very similar to COPD, and it's often misdiagnosed. So most pulmonologists, when they're ruling out a patient for COPD, will also test them for this alpha-1 deficiency um, because the treatment options are much different than the treatment options for COPD. One of the things I wanted to go over is a COPD action plan. And if you were an asthmatic, you may have an asthma action plan. And what this is, is a visual guide um, provided by the American Lung Association that most healthcare providers use and encourage our patients to use because it helps you to identify when you're starting to have an exacerbation or a flare of your lung disease. So you chart your symptoms, and then you have your actions that you and your healthcare provider have worked out. You can start to see if you're starting to have a little bit of thicker phlegm or mucus. You may dismiss that normally on a, you know, a regular day. If you've had a little bit more coughing than usual, you may dismiss that. But if you're using an action plan and you're charting out your daily symptoms, it helps you to see that things are starting to change before it becomes a more severe exacerbation. Um, so again, we always encourage our patients to use these um, because it's a good visual guide to help you to be aware of changes in your breathing. Next, I was going to talk about interstitial lung disease. 
This includes more than 200 different conditions that cause inflammation and scarring around the balloon-like air sacs in your lungs called the alveoli. Oxygen travels through the alveoli into your bloodstream, and when they're scarred, they don't expand as much, and as a result, less oxygen enters your blood. Other parts of your lungs can be affected by interstitial lung disease too, such as airways, lung lining, and blood vessels. Idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, often just referred to as pulmonary fibrosis, is the most common. And there are five main categories um, or identifiable causes of pulmonary fibrosis. It can be drug-induced, radiation-induced, environmental, autoimmune, or occupational. In the United States, environmental and autoimmune causes are the most common types of pulmonary fibrosis. The Pulmonary Fibrosis Association is an excellent resource for information about this disease. They have a thorough website and they also have support groups. Over the last several years, there have been many medication breakthroughs in the treatment of pulmonary fibrosis. Pulmonary hypertension is another chronic lung disease. This is when the high blood pressure in the arteries of your lungs and the right affects the arteries of your lungs and the right side of the heart. The blood vessels in the lungs become hard and narrow and this causes the heart to work harder to pump blood through the lungs. Symptoms include shortness of breath, dizziness, fatigue, chest pressure, and swelling in the ankles or legs. Similar to COPD, this disease is classified in stages of one to four based on symptoms, with four being the most symptomatic. The causes can be idiopathic or unknown, genetic, related to medication use or related to underlying conditions such as left-sided heart disease or lung disease. Um, treatment includes various types of medications, um, including ones that dilate the blood vessels, which are called vasodilators, and oxygen therapy. So the American Lung Association sponsors Better Breathers Clubs. These groups meet in several towns throughout the state um, and nationwide, and they offer education, information, and support for those with COPD and other breathing disorders. Um, Gaylord hosts the Better Breathers Club on the first Thursday of every month. Currently, we're on hold due to COVID, but we're hoping that we can restart in-person meetings soon. Um, and until then, many support groups are having Zoom and online meetings um, available during the current pandemic. And they also, many support groups break off into subgroups based on diagnosis. So if you join a Better Breathers Club, um, you, there's the opportunity at different meetings to connect with patients that have either COPD, if you have COPD, or perhaps pulmonary fibrosis, if that's your underlying diagnosis. Stress, as we all know, um, can increase breathing difficulty and can affect our health negatively. Again, being short of breath, which most people with chronic lung disease experience on a daily basis, can make people more anxious and afraid. So it's important to know what helps relax yourself or a person that you know with breathing difficulty um, to manage, reduce stress and manage the effect on breathing. Um, feeling like you're struggling to breathe is an awful feeling and it causes anxiety and makes breathing more difficult. Um, and one of the worst things we always say as healthcare providers that we can say to somebody that says they can't breathe is you're okay. When you can't breathe, it doesn't help to have somebody telling you that you're fine, you're okay, just take a deep breath. Each person has something that they can find to utilize to help with managing that stress. A lot of our patients use things such as soft music, breathing exercises, or distractions to relax and take my, their mind off their breathing. And it's especially important to maintain management of stress during the current pandemic because everybody is at a heightened level of stress during the situation. Support for healthy eating. So we always tell our patients um, that it's important to maintain a good diet, especially if you have underlying pulmonary disease. Um, it's good to give the lungs some room to work. So a lot of times with our COPD patients, we recommend eating smaller meals more frequently. And that's because large meals um, can push kind of your stomach to push up on your diaphragm, which then makes it feel a very full feeling, which can make it feel like it's more difficult to take a deep breath. Also, dairy products tend to increase mucus, um, which people who have COPD have trouble with. So we advise patients to avoid consuming too many dairy products and be aware of your salt intake. Um, salt can cause water retention, which can make it more difficult to breathe. 
And also being overweight or underweight can make managing COPD or any lung disease more challenging. Depression. When someone has a chronic breathing disorder, um, depression can be common and it's important to recognize the signs of depression in yourself or your family member if that's the person who has chronic pulmonary disease. Um, things such as decrease in appetite or a large increase in appetite, feeling tired or uninterested in activities, um, withdrawing from friends and family, having trouble concentrating um, and feeling hopeless, and you want to have a network of support um, or participating in a support group can help the affected person so that they don't feel alone. And again, the current COVID pandemic has made many people much more isolated than before. Um, so it's important to recognize and try to use resources available, such as Zoom or FaceTime or even just texting and phone calls to try to stay as connected as possible with family members and friends. Exercise is important because it helps us, whether we are affected by lung disease or not, it helps us to maintain our health. And especially in the current situation with the pandemic, it's important to maintain our health as much as possible. Exercise, again, that's appropriate for a person who has COPD or a chronic breathing condition can help them feel less short of breath. Um, and it's important to encourage a patient or a person with COPD or chronic pulmonary disease to plan on regular exercise. But it's also important to recognize what's reasonable for the individual. Um, we don't expect our patients who have been limited due to their health from exercising to get out and walk, you know, two miles. You want to start small and build up from there. Um, we usually recommend starting with something like a short distance walk if you're able. If not, something that you could do at home that's low impact that you can do in your living room, whether it be with a video or with exercise bands or something simple like that just to get started. Again, um, offering to go for a walk with someone who has COPD, even if it's just a short distance, that can help them get moving and get going with starting exercise. Um, and there's been some recent studies that show that Tai Chi is an effective low impact exercise for those with COPD or chronic pulmonary disease. Um, and there are online classes available for Tai Chi or even beginner yoga um, for patients. There's things such as seated and chair yoga that are offered and those are available online as well for various resources. And those are excellent ways to start low impact exercise and then build up endurance from there. Pulmonary rehab programs help those with COPD and chronic breathing conditions to manage their breathing while exercising. We here at Gaylord offer a nine-week program um, with either morning or afternoon classes that meet twice a week for two hours. Our classes aim to increase exercise ability and endurance. Um, we use various pieces of equipment to focus on your upper or lower body, um, and we work at the pace that our patients can move at and try to build them up from there. And we also, during these sessions, provide education on pulmonary disease. We provide a different educational topic each week. Um, we may discuss nutrition one week. Um, we may discuss your disease and recognizing signs of progression of your disease the next week. Um, and the topics are changed each week. And also focused on the group and what's affecting the group at the time. Recently, our program reopened. We reopened on June 1st. We had been closed due to the pandemic. Um, we are following all CDC guidelines as well as limiting the class size to allow for social distancing during our pulmonary rehab class. We're gonna go over a couple of breathing exercises. These can help if they're practiced regularly, um, rid the lungs of accumulated stale air, increase oxygen levels, and allow your diaphragm, which is your main breathing muscle, to return to its job of helping you breathe. Um, they've also helped patients to relieve the breathlessness they feel with some chronic pulmonary disease. The first one we're gonna go over is pursed lip breathing. Um, so this is what a lot of patients use as they're starting to get mobile and exercise when they're affected by chronic lung disease. And it helps because it helps to regulate the breathing and it helps to relieve some of that shortness of breath that patients feel. So basically it's reducing the number of breaths you take and keeping your airways open longer. And it's simply breathing through your nose and breathing out at least twice as long through your mouth with pursed lips. So basically you're taking a deep breath in through your nose and breathing it out. 
while pursing your lips. Um, and that just helps with controlling the breath and easing that shortness of breath feeling. The next one is belly breathing. So you start by breathing in through your nose and when doing so, you're paying attention to how your stomach built, fills up with air. Then you wanna breathe out through your mouth again, two to three times as long as your inhalation while relaxing your neck and shoulders and training your diaphragm to take on the work of helping to fill and empty your lungs. So when we go over this with patients, we have them put their hands on their stomach when they're breathing, have them take a big deep breath in through their nose, feel how your stomach expands when you do that, and then breathe out through your mouth two to three times longer than your inhalation. So you're gonna do a And you wanna feel that, keep your hand on your stomach, feel your diaphragm as it moves up when you're breathing um, and feel as you're trying to relax and relax your shoulders and neck while you're breathing out. A lot of these breathing exercises we utilize in programs such as pulmonary rehab to help our patients as they're learning to pace themselves during exercise and learning to regulate their breathing so that they don't become short of breath during exercise sessions. And the next slide is just a diagram of what we just went over. I'm um, showing that during um, inspiration, your diaphragm is contracting, and during expiration, your diaphragm, which again is that main muscle of breathing, is relaxing. Energy conservation is important for anyone with chronic lung disease. Um, just by having chronic lung disease, you're using much more energy to breathe. And sometimes when you think about how much energy you use every day, it's amazing, and that why, it was why we suggest the um, four P's of energy conservation. Planning your day can help save energy. If you know what you have to do when you plan it out, then you can avoid unnecessary trips back and forth or having to return to the same area within the house to get various things. Then you wanna prioritize what is most important to use your energy on. And then you wanna position the space you work and live in to decrease energy waste. So if you know that in the morning you need to go to the kitchen and get your breakfast done, you want to make sure that you have all the tools that you need out in that area so that you don't have to keep walking into a different room or a different area of the house to get things. Um, that helps too when you're getting ready for your day, pacing yourself and positioning what you need as you get ready and you do your activities of daily living, such as showering, getting dressed, if you have chronic lung disease, things such as that can be very exhausting. Um, so we always tell our patients um, to remember by getting yourself ready and planning ahead and pacing yourself, you're um, saving your energy and then you're having consistent energy utilization, which is best. What we find often, and um, previous to the COVID pandemic, when I've given a similar talk at several facilities, most times we find that a lot of people with chronic lung disease are on various medications, and a lot of times they have no idea what their medications are for. I added that to this presentation just to go over some of the basics. You have your short-acting bronchodilators, which are also known as your rescue medications. Those are your medications that you're going to take off an inhaler form. Um, and you're gonna take those when you're having a problem and you're having an emergency and you can't breathe. Then you have your long-acting bronchodilators, which are your maintenance medications. These are the things you take every day, but it's not the medication you wanna take when you're having a flare-up or an emergency. There's also inhaled corticosteroids, and then there's corticosteroids which are given either via pill form or sometimes in the hospital with an IV. There's combination medications, which combine steroids and bronchodilators. And then there's muscarinic, which are also known as anticholinergic bronchodilators. And these kind of um, relax the smooth muscles to help with breathing. And this is one of the charts that comes out every year and it's updated with all the different medications for respiratory inhalers. So these are a lot of the things that people are prescribed for use at home. And again, a lot of times people have several inhalers or several medications, and they're not sure what each one is for. Up in the top left-hand corner, we have your short-acting bronchodilators. These, again, are your rescue medications. These are the medications you want to use when you're having a flare-up or an exacerbation and you're having a difficult time breathing. 
And if you have one of these and you find that you're using it more and more, that should be a sign to contact your healthcare provider because it probably means that you're in an exacerbation or a worsening of your condition. Then we have your long-acting bronchodilators. So these are the maintenance meds that people take, the type of medication that you're going to take every day, um, mostly inhalers, sometimes it can be a pill, and these are things that you're taking to maintain your lung health. But again, you don't want to take your long-acting bronchodilator if you're having an emergency. This is a maintenance med. Then we have the inhaled steroids. These reduce the swelling in the airways, which can help with relieving some of the symptoms of your coughing, wheezing, and shortness of breath. Um, and then we have our combination medications. These contain steroids and long-acting um, bronchodilators. Some of the more common ones in the last couple years are the Brio, um, that's the third one in, and then the Enoro, and in the last couple of years has come out Trelegy, and this is a combination of the Enoro with um, added medication to it. So it's a long-acting bronchodilator, a long-acting muscarinic, um, and an inhaled corticosteroid. So your physician will prescribe these, and there's also different um, generics. So in the last couple of years, Advair had been popular. That's a combination medication, and we're starting to see patients who are now on Wixella, which is the generic Advair, um, which came out in the last few years. Um, another thing with the medications is with steroids, you want to rinse your mouth out after use because you can develop what's called a thrush infection, which is kind of like a a white coating on your tongue and an aggravation in your mouth. But a lot of patients can't remember, I take three or four inhalers, which one do I rinse out after? So our advice is always, if you're not sure, rinse your mouth out after every inhaler use. It's just better for safety. That way you don't risk running into that situation. So next we're gonna talk about caregiving. Um, it's important if somebody has chronic lung disease, if they have a caregiver available, um, that they utilize that person for help. Help with medications, such as picking up medications, remembering to take them, a person to take their medications, um, making sure that they're taking the right medication at the right dose at the right time. Supporting the person in understanding which medications to take in times of difficulty breathing. And again, that's that understanding what's your rescue medication. What should you take when you can't breathe versus what's your long-acting medication that you want to take for maintenance. And then again, supporting the person dealing with payment for medications. A lot of these medications, especially what we hear from patients that the Brio, um, the Enoro, and the Trelegy are extremely expensive, over $200 a month for some patients, depending on insurance. But all these companies offer um, assistance. So if you talk to your physician or if you call the company directly, most of them offer either coupons or assistance programs with the cost of these meds. A lot of times, we see patients that come into the hospital because they didn't pick up their medications because of the cost. So we always encourage our patients to talk to your physician if the cost is a barrier, see if there's a program available through the physician or through the medication manufacturer, and if not, talk to your physician to, about alternatives. Often your doctor's prescribing a medication that they think would be good for you with your situation, but if you can't afford it and you're not going to take it, that's not going to help anyone. So have that conversation with your physician if cost is a barrier and see if there's an alternative or something that can be worked out to help you so that you can get that medication. Other areas for support um, with caregivers is helping to manage medical appointments and arranging for transportation. I'm going with the person to take notes and ask questions. As we all know, sometimes we go to the doctor and they rattle off 10 different things and we get home and we can remember two of them. And when you're a person dealing with chronic lung disease, it's important to understand what information the doctor has given you. So we always advise our patients, if you have somebody available to go with you, it's great to have that person available to take notes and ask questions. That way when you get home, you have that information. And I know that most doctors give you a printout or a snapshot or they have a portal where you can see a snapshot of your visit, but often that information is lacking and some of the things that they told you during your appointment are missed. Um, so again, that's why we always say it's great to have somebody to go with you and take notes and ask questions. I know I myself, sometimes I get home from the doctor and I think, oh God, what did they tell me I was supposed to do? So 
again, it's important to make sure that you have a support person if available to help with that. And making sure that you understand who to call for what problems. If you have a pulmonologist and you're having an issue with your breathing, your pulmonologist will be your first phone call. If you have another issue, you would be calling your primary care physician. And when you have underlying lung disease and you have multiple different physicians, you just want to make sure that you're clear and any caregiver that you have is clear on who to call for what issue. And then using your COPD or asthma action plan, which we went over earlier, um, that can help you identify when your breathing is changing and help you to notice those subtle changes that are leading to a flare-up. Important to be able to recognize the signs of depression, not only for the person with chronic lung disease, but also for the caregiver. Caregiving is not an easy thing to do, and often we don't know our own limits, and we wear ourselves out when trying to help others. Um, and when you're trying to help somebody with chronic lung disease, it's important to be aware of that so you don't give too much of yourself and then end up having health issues as well. There are support groups for caregivers. Many hospitals offer support groups um, as well as online resources to support the caregiver and help the person who is acting in that role of caregiver to feel that they have support and to enable them to care for themselves. We generally don't recommend home remedies, but we know that some patients have them. Um, we only don't because, you know, based in healthcare, we always look at what's got evidence behind it. Um, but I have not, I can't think of any offhand that we don't recommend. I know that some of our patients use things such as um, different things for relaxation, but if you have a chronic breathing disorder, you may want to be careful with things such as incense. Um, because I know that can exacerbate some patients' breathing issues and cause coughing. Um, and I know like some of our patients use things such as neti pots, which is a home remedy if you have a lot of congestion. And we just really emphasize to make sure that you're cleaning that properly to make sure you're not giving yourself a secondary infection related to that use. Thank you everybody very much. I appreciate your attending. Um, I hope everybody has a wonderful day and stays safe and stays healthy.